years, and they're going to uh, die suddenly. We're going to see people, instead of dying in their 70s or late 60s, in their 40s, 50s, maybe even in their mid-30s. I'm lucky that I got through all that so far, but I don't think I would do it again. Knowing what I know today, I would not do it again. Despite his findings, Santora can't prove his fears. His study group was too small to draw big conclusions. The problem with studying illicit drug use in general, and with steroids in particular, is that you just can't go out and do a laboratory study. You can't intentionally put people on steroids for 20 years to find out what happens to them, because the Human Studies Committee would not permit that. So, for ethical reasons, the only way that you can study these phenomena is just to go out there in nature and see what you can find. And when you do that, there are all kinds of methodological limitations which make it hard to get convincing, solid results without the risk of some sort of distortion. As doctors search for answers, some steroid users ignore the danger signs. Some doctors blame their own profession. It took the medical community an amazingly long time to actually concede that steroids do work. Even today, you can still find, for example, in the physician's desk reference, statements that steroids have no value for enhancing athletic performance. So that having failed on that count, they were also discounted when they started talking about potential dangers of steroids because they had already lost their credibility. And with the loss of medical credibility came increased use. They're going to always be part of powerlifting and bodybuilding and strongman sports like that. But now you could go down to any high school that has, you know, big time sporting program and someone's going to have roids. All of the danger signs, everything we needed to know was right in front of us. In the Tour de France, blowouts usually happen during the race. In 2006, the big blowout happened three days after the race ended. The Tour de France has taken yet another blow as American Floyd Landis has tested positive for steroids. It is the first... Officials announced they had found an abnormal ratio of testosterone in the urine of Floyd Landis, the American who won the tour. Landis was stripped of his title. It wasn't the tour's first steroid scandal. In 1998, so many riders were found with performance-enhancing drugs, the race was dubbed the Tour of Shame. I said years ago, and people raise their eyes, you can't win the Tour de France without drugs. It's been dirty since its inception. Not too many people are raising their eyebrows about that statement anymore. From cycling to baseball, steroids can be found in almost every sport. Now, steroids are moving into arenas where the stakes are small, but the risks are just as high. They're going to always be part of powerlifting and bodybuilding and strongman sports like that, but they really have no business, in my opinion, being in baseball and football and these games that kids start out playing in their backyards. The most detrimental thing that a teenager can do is take steroids. But they are. And Taylor Hooten was one of them. One, two, three, win! Taylor was a great kid. Always had a smile on his face, cracking jokes. Very, very popular at school. And he must have been a good-looking kid. Girls over here all the time. But he made great grades in school. He was carrying a 3.8 grade average. Uh, he'd made super scores on his SATs. And he and I were getting ready to make college visits. Taylor Hooten was an average 16-year-old high school student until January 2003. That's when he decided to try out for the varsity baseball team. In less than three months, he gained 30 pounds, along with acne, a puffy face, and bad breath. All side effects of steroids. According to the Centers for Disease Control, between 700 and 850,000 teens have used steroids. One in 20. All you need to do is read Jose Canseco's book. A clear message gets sent that, that, at least in his opinion, steroids were a panacea to success. 
What can be bad about earning millions of dollars, being on the TV every night, setting records, having the women fawn all over them? Very little downside has befallen our professional athletes, those that have chosen to use steroids. According to experts, few teens understand the dangers lurking in a growing steroid market. Today, steroids can be easily purchased online from labs in places like Mexico, Thailand, and India. We've heard stories of those vials being filled with flaxseed oil, all the way to those vials containing motor oil. And these kids, our children, are taking these and injecting them into the vein. Soon after Taylor began taking steroids, his personality changed. But what we saw in Taylor was something that was much more severe than normal mood swing. On two occasions, he took his pitching hand and drove it through a sheetrock wall. All of the danger signs, everything we needed to know was right in front of us. But we didn't recognize it as steroids because neither we nor our family doctor had been trained to know what to look for. While quitting steroids, Taylor slid into a deep depression. On the morning of July 15, 2003, he went into his room, put a belt around his neck, and hanged himself. Stuff like this is not supposed to happen in a middle America, well-educated community. But the fact of the matter is, it is going on. For Taylor Hooten, steroids exacted a price out of all proportion to his goal. He wasn't aiming for a major league contract or a seven-figure salary. He just wanted what any team wants, to belong. After Taylor died, several of the kids in particular that were on Taylor's team admitted to, to my wife and I that they had been doing steroids. And, and for a period, most of them were scared straight. But something happened over time, something that's really, really scary. A number of those kids went back to using anabolic steroids within a few weeks after we put Taylor in the ground. The temptation to use steroids seemed to outweigh the perceived risks. But what could cause a healthy teen to take his own life? The answer lies deep in the brain. When you take steroids, your hypothalamus in your brain sees all of this steroid coming in from the outside. And so it sends a message down to the testis saying, we've already got plenty of steroids on board, don't manufacture any more, there's ample on, on supply already. Overwhelmed, the testes shut down, a condition called hypogonadism. Taylor stopped taking steroids cold turkey, leaving him low on testosterone and high on risk. They get profound depressions and may even get suicidal during that period when their testosterone level is is low before the testis can come back online. In one survey of adults who use steroids, 4% reported attempting suicide during withdrawal. Other experts believe the numbers are far lower, but for Don Hooten, the statistics don't change his reality. His home run ball from June 16th of 2001 and the reason that's important it was his first and at the same time his very last home run. Uh, I got to go chasing this out in the weeds after he hit it uh, very much like uh, a dad would do when your kids just hit his first home run. Don Hooten now runs a foundation in Taylor's name to protect other teens from steroids. In 2007 Texas passed Taylor's Law, the nation's largest steroid screening program for high school athletes. But today, the fastest growing group of steroid users are not high school students or professional athletes. The stereotypical perception is some giant freak with a syringe sticking out of his forehead and, and, and you know, it's gonna eat my children for lunch and, you know, that's just the, the people that are like, they're like, ah, that's their perception. The reality is that there's millions of people that use steroids that are out in the general public that you would have no idea, that resemble an everyday person. It's estimated that over 50% of all steroid users are not athletes of any kind. 
the more typical steroid user is not someone in the upper levels of athletics and may not even compete in any athletic performance at all, but who uses the drugs largely for the purposes of personal appearance rather than to succeed at any specific competitive endeavor. A 2007 study suggests that many steroid users may actually be educated working professionals in their 30s. Everyday people turning to steroids just to look better. My gosh, we're living in a generation of, of young men and women that have been brainwashed by Madison Avenue to be buffed. We're living in a generation where all they know is instant gratification. Something they hope steroids can deliver. From Mr. Universe to the boy next door, anybody can be tempted by steroids, even the very best. At the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney, the American track and field star Marion Jones won five medals. Sports writers crowned her the greatest female athlete in the world. However, in 2007, she admitted using steroids while training for the Summer Games. Her world records were invalidated, her medals forfeited. At age 31, one of the world's greatest female athletes announced her retirement from her sport. As a trainer, do I want my athletes on steroids? Well, obviously not. But as a consumer, you're demanding. You're demanding the very best out of athletes. And those athletes are going to do what they can to get that to happen. And when they do that, they start to push that limit. And that's a limit that you know, unfortunately, is found in that anabolic steroid. If athletes still use steroids in the most drug-tested competition, where won't they use them? Oddly, in the very sport where they may be most abused. In an ocean of steroids, a handful of athletes are swimming against the tide. In Portland, Maine, begins a competition with unusual athletes, natural bodybuilders rebels in a sport infected by steroids. These athletes reject steroids, both the benefits and the costs. And no one knows the costs better than their coach, former Mr. Universe and ex-steroid user, Steve Mahalik. Okay guys, uh, this is what it's all about. All that hard work you put in the gym just amounts for a few minutes on stage, so just really enjoy yourself. From Watertown, Massachusetts, please welcome contestant number eight, Michael Manovian. The most formidable challenger here is unseen, temptation. Winning is intoxicating, and steroids are enticing, even to a man they've nearly killed. I will have suffered through the stroke, the heart attack, the liver disorders, the mental disorders, the mental anguish. But what I personally do it again, yes, that's, listen to the draw of that stuff. For one moment in time, Steve Mahalik was the best there was on planet Earth. Number one. That's a hard thing to discount. Come on, everything you got. At Mahalik's gym on Long Island, he trains a new generation of bodybuilders to do as he says not as he did. These kids and these, these grown men need a leader. They need someone who's been there. They need someone who can take them to the place they want to go without getting sick or ill. Bear the pain, spare the shame. Let's go. So what I try to do when a guy's sincere, I will teach them how to exercise and have a degree of muscle that their genetics will allow them to have and make them understand that that's as good as you're going to get. I'm looking, I'm watching the muscle. They got a lot in them. There you go, baby. All right. It's very difficult for them to win in the arena of the steroid contest and bodybuilding. You can win clean in natural contests and you can win clean up to certain levels in pro contests. Boy, from golfer to bodybuilding. Just after that, you cannot. That's the truth. It's a harsh reality for athletes. For many, steroids can be priceless the difference between a salary and a fortune, between mediocrity and stardom.
One of our patients was able to summarize it in just a single word, namely, why should I be Clark Kent when I can be Superman? <laughs>